Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day today on this cold Tuesday afternoon in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we have a wonderful program today to share with you with some uh, very uh, important people who are doing some great things. And we're going to jump right into it. We want to thank our uh, viewers who are watching on Zoom and as, uh, as well as our uh, audience on Facebook for tuning in. Um, we want to thank you for joining us for this uh, very special trilateral program hosted by the World Affairs Council of San Antonio and the City of San Antonio uh, through its Global Engagement Office. This is uh, called Biodiversity Without Borders, a Natural Pathway for Cooperation. Uh, if you're in the wrong Zoom program today, don't worry. We still want you to stay on and listen to this uh, presentation. Uh, this is a two-part program celebrating the monarch butterfly, uh, which is an important symbol linking Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. Uh, the first part will include remarks from our very own Mayor Ron Nuremberg and the Consul Generals of Mexico and Canada. The second half will feature city representatives from uh, Montreal, Guadalajara, and those right here in San Antonio discussing the importance of local policies to support biodiversity and access to nature. Um, we also have something very unique. We have uh, interpreters who will be uh, interpreting in Spanish and French. And uh, that, those instructions are in the chat room right now. Uh, there's a little globe at the bottom for you to pick the language that you would like to hear the translation in. Um, and we will put those up uh, uh, in the chat room right now. The bios of everyone listed today will be also in the chat room. So we will provide brief bios for, uh, for the guests today. Um, and with that, I want to introduce uh, someone who will be uh, presenting the first part or introducing the first part uh, Sherry Donat Shahi. She is the Chief Diplomacy and Protocol Officer heading the City of San Antonio's International Relations Office, uh, also known as the Global Engagement Office. Um, and Sherry advises, assists, supports San Antonio elected officials, uh, the mayor, and others in the community about international affairs and is responsible for co coordinating official foreign travel of the mayor and council leaders and many others. She is also the on the board of many organizations, including our very own World Affairs Council of San Antonio. Uh, thank you all for joining us and I'm gonna hand it off to Sherry uh, as of now. So thank you so much. Thank you, Armin. And uh, again, thank you for your work on this event and collaboration. Welcome to all of our panelists. Welcome to all of our attendees today. Uh, before we do go into introductions, I also wanted to kind of just add a note about the interpretation feature. This is only available to anybody who is connected via Zoom. So any attendees on the line who are in uh, watching this session today in Zoom have the option to listen to the sessions either in French or in Spanish if they would prefer. So just wanted to add that on. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the mayor of San Antonio, the Honorable Ron Nuremberg. Uh, our mayor has, has been the mayor of San Antonio since 2017, and he was a term council member before that, one of his most enduring legacies is surely going to be his advocacy and his passion for sustainability, resilience, and protecting the environment. Uh, of course, uh, one of his first actions when he came into city council, uh, sorry, uh, in as mayor uh, in 2017 was to, to join the cities uh, uh, around the world that advocated and uh, for the Paris Environmental Accord and signed a resolution with city council. And last year, the uh, climate action plan of San Antonio was approved by city council. And so this climate action and adaptation plan is very, very important 
part of the legacy also of our mayor in San Antonio. He has many other accolades. He's been uh, up until recently the chairman of Sister Cities International and now serving as chairman emeritus of the organization, a strong believer in relationship building around the world, a strong believer in San Antonio's sister city relationships. And I would uh, welcome uh, and please join me in welcoming uh, Mayor Ron Nirenberg. Well, good afternoon and thank you very much, Sherry. Um, it's an honor to be here with you all. And thank you also, Armin, uh, for the World Affairs Council's leadership on this event. I'm a big believer in the mission of the World Affairs Council of San Antonio and all of the work that it does on an annual basis. It gives me such pleasure to be here with my friends, the Consuls General of both Canada and Mexico. Thank you, Rachel and Ruben, for joining us today, as well as our important, important partners at the San Antonio River Authority and the San Antonio River Foundation. Thank you, Suzanne and Freitas. Monica, we are happy to have found a home for our event with the Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Festival. And I encourage all to go online and review their many wonderful and free activities. I'm also pleased to welcome into this vital conversation our colleagues from the cities of Montreal and Guadalajara and from ICLE and the National Wildlife Foundation. We're honored that you could join us today and I predict that this is the beginning of a very strong and vibrant collaboration on matters of great and urgent importance. Montreal Mayor Valerie Plant is currently serving as honorary ambassadors uh, for Cities with Nature and earlier this year challenged many mayors around the world to work with her and others to empower our community and raise awareness about the value of biodiversity and nature's contribution to human health and well-being. Guadalajara Mayor Ismael del Toro has also shown great leadership in raising awareness in his city of the importance of protecting nature and has championed an expansive tree canopy project in his city. It's especially meaningful to have both Guadalajara and Montreal represented today as our three cities are all members of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network, an international cooperative alliance of cities that have pledged to leverage creativity and culture into sustainable development. As members, these cities are committed to sharing their very best practices and developing partnerships for action and innovation, such as the implementation of the 2030 Sustainability Plan development goals. The Sustainable Development Goals, more commonly referred to as SDGs, are 17 goals and 169 targets established by the United Nations resolution to be a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. This is important for us to remember as caring for nature is essential to a sustainable future. And we're happy to be working with our North American neighbors to steward our shared home on earth. This morning in my meeting with both consuls general, I learned about some of the updates on the environmental provisions of the USMCA agreement and to the potential of leveraging those protections and agreements. At the local level, we are watching to make sure that our community takes the necessary steps to address environmental issues. And as such, I commit to joining cities around the world to prioritize investments that elevate and regenerate the beauty and livability of our community, as well as to protect the native species, air, water, and land that sustains us. Specifically, we will work toward enhancing green infrastructure, mitigating the urban heat island, regenerating biodiversity, and more. These are major greenhouse gas reduction and resiliency strategies in the climate and Ac action and adaptation plan which the city of San Antonio adopted and ratified on October 17th, 2019, one year and 10 years ago today exactly. I'm happy to know that Patrick Fitzgerald will speak of the Mayor's Monarch Pledge and our Office of Sustainability is well represented by Julia Murphy and who will highlight some of San Antonio's important initiatives. I would like to take this opportunity also to express my deep appreciation for the gift that will be shortly announced. It is a surprise and I can't reveal it yet, but I eagerly await its development and fruition and look forward to introducing my son to its richness and beauty. 
Thank you to all who have made this possible, especially to Consulates General of Canada and Mexico and to the River Authority and River Foundation, the San Antonio, Mexico Friendship Council, the World Heritage Office, the Arts and Culture Department of San Antonio and the Economic Development Department. We acknowledge that the natural world does not understand geopolitical borders and we celebrate working together to protect and to preserve our collective natural assets and to make them accessible to all. So let, let us take the beautiful monarch butterfly, the state insect of Texas, as well as the powerful symbol and promise of our future cooperation. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Mayor Nirenberg. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rachel McCormick, Consul General of Canada to the states of Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. She comes with a very strong background in environmental issues as her PhD focused on environmental science. And she was head of the energy and environment section at the Canadian Embassy in Washington, DC prior to taking up her her current post. Her portfolio has included sustainable development, climate change, and circumpolar affairs, including work with the Arctic Council and the United Nations. Welcome, Consul General, to the forum and to San Antonio. Thank you so much, Sherry and Armin. Thank you to the World Affairs Council of San Antonio for hosting us. I have to say this is my first Zoom webinar where there's been simultaneous translation. So amazing work there. I think the resilience uh, that we're all showing in these days is, is really telling. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Consul General Minuti, good to see you again. And I was actually thinking um, it, it's fitting that we have the, the three R's uh, on this day where we're celebrating sustainability and, and, and environmental cooperation with our first names. But I'm so pleased to be with you today to celebrate North American environmental stewardship. Uh, of course, there's no better place for such a celebration. In our archives at the Lester B. Pearson Building in Ottawa, where Global Affairs Canada is located, uh, the equivalent of the US State Department, uh, there are photos of the initialing of the original NAFTA on a sparkling day in the fall of 1992 on a beautiful plaza in San Antonio. And of course, uh, the, the symbol of the North American Commission for Environmental Cooperation located in Montreal uh, for their headquarters is the monarch butterfly, uh, a symbol of the connected nature of our three countries. And today we also celebrate the inclusion of an environment chapter in the NAFTA's successor, the USMCA, which it went into effect on July 3rd. Canada is firmly supported, uh, supporting the principle that trade liberalization and environmental protection are mutually supportive. And I think pollinators are actually a very good example of how um, we rely on nature as well. Pollinators are key to food security, but we need to provide them the important habitat that they need to survive across our three countries. Such a wonderful symbol of, of how we're connected in nature and also to each other. Under the new NAF, a new commitments have been added to, related to specific multilateral environmental agreements. And it reflects the importance that the parties are placing on their respective obligations to protect the environment. In addition, changes have been made so that parties can more easily, more easily challenge violations that might be taking place in either country. We are very committed to working with the US and Mexico to ensure the effective implementation of this chapter and that the parallel environmental cooperation agreement retains and modernizes the important trilateral institutions that were established under NAFTA. And we're, lo we're looking forward to lots of concrete action on the ground to enhance our collective biodiversity. And I'm so excited to see three great cities representing um, their countries in sharing their real life experiences in terms of biodiversity, sustainability, and also culture. Thank you to the city of San Antonio, the San Antonio River Authority and the San Antonio River Foundation and our partners at the Consulate General of Mexico in San Antonio for letting us be part of today's events. Gracias and merci. Thank you very much, Consul General McCormick. And I will now like to turn to your counterpart here in, uh, in San Antonio and introduce Dr. Ruben Minuti Sanata, who was appointed Consul General of Mexico in San Antonio just before the pandemic struck. 
Uh, and fortunately, Consul General Minuti is familiar with our community. He studied in Austin previously and got his, uh, his law degree from the University of Texas School of Law. Uh, and he uh, received his PhD from the UNAM, the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and has served as a magistrate at the administrative courts of Mexico City. He is an expert on the US Constitution and has even published a Spanish translation of the US Constitution. Consul General Minuti, uh, welcome. Adelante. Thank you very much, Sherry. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your kind presentation, Sherry, uh, Rachel, Major. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, again. Thank you uh, to uh, Armin, uh, World Affairs Council, for putting together this event and this, this wonderful opportunity for us to, to talk about these topics that are uh, our, our common concern. I am honored to join this panel with, uh, with such distinguished guests. I would like to begin by acknowledging the importance of uh, strengthening trilateral cooperation between Canada, the US, the United States and Mexico. Our three countries are more than just neighbors. We think that uh, we are true partners, allies, and above of all, friends. As we all know, since the signing of NAFTA, today the USMCA, that uh, Rachel was uh, recalling right here in San Antonio, the North America region has become one of the most prosperous and dynamic in the world. But not only have we succeeded in the economic sphere, trilateral cooperation goes well beyond trade and investment. We are key allies in addressing environmental issues, environmental and social issues that span the three countries. North America is a biologically diverse continent with unique agroclimatic regimes spectacular ecosystems, majestic forests, and impressive wildlife. However, the human footprint has endangered many of our endemic species, such as the monarch butterfly, whose annual migration goes from the northeastern US and Canada to the overwintering grounds in south, uh, southwestern Mexico. Today, more than ever, our countries must continue working in cross-border as well as cross-disciplinary collaboration with regard to addressing the multitude of environmental challenges of our time and to ensure the conservation of our biodiversity. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge San Antonio's and Canada's effort in this regard. SA Climate Ready's Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, as well as Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change are definitely steps in the right direction towards the fulfillment of the Paris Agreement. By the same token, Mexico is fully committed with the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals set by the United Nations, including goal number 13, which reads, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. I am certain that if we continue working together, boosting cooperation both at the federal and specifically at the local level, engaging cities, towns, counties, and communities of all kinds, we will ensure the protection of our shared environments, our biodiversity, and wildlife. As I mentioned this morning, you are all invited to Mexico. I would love to have an event, uh, maybe only virtually in the, in the short term, but whenever it's feasible, I would like to have you all down in Mexico at the sanctuary of the monarch butterfly for us to have a, a, an event and enjoy uh, nature and enjoy the butterfly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Consul General Minuti. It now gives me great pleasure to announce our next guest, Suzanne Scott, General Manager of the San Antonio River Authority. Uh, she has an exciting announcement to make. We have been keeping this under the wraps and we're thrilled that we could come together and celebrate this big reveal, at least in this virtual space. I've said enough for now, and I'd like to introduce Suzanne Furs, who has been general manager since 2007, and in that time has overseen 
the River Authority's $384 million uh, San Antonio River Improvements Project that restored 13 miles, or we could say over 20 kilometers of our beautiful waterway and added hike, bike, and paddling trails. She is currently overseeing the $264 million transformation of the San Pedro Creek uh, into the San Pedro Creek Culture Park. And we have been eagerly watching the exciting signs of progress. This is her last week at the San Antonio River Authority before she joins the Nature Conservancy of Texas as the new president and CEO of that organization. And Suzanne, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Sherry. It's uh, very nice to be here today, and thank you so much for that kind introduction. It is a pleasure to be part of this Biodiversity um, Without Borders program, and we do have a presentation that I believe that uh, Stephen Schauer is going to bring up for me. Thank you so much. The opening remarks from Mayor Nuremberg, Dr. McCormick, and Dr. Minuti were inspiring, and I look forward to the upcoming environmental policy discussion that we'll have later today. But first, I have the distinct pleasure of announcing a special trilateral project that will soon be underway here in San Antonio, known as the North American Friendship Garden. Today's announcement is a virtual groundbreaking for this collaborative project. Inspired by the intrepid migration of the monarch butterfly, the North American Friendship Garden is a collaborative effort by the Council of Canada in Texas and the Consulate of Mexico in San Antonio, together with the City of San Antonio, the San Antonio River Authority, the San Antonio River Foundation. Located within Confluence Park, an award-winning environmental education park along the banks of the San Antonio River, this pollinator garden is designed to provide a sanctuary for the monarchs during their international migration, as well as crucial habitat, habitat for a myriad of other pollinators. More symbolically, the trilateral effort represents the close ties between the Canadian and Mexican consulates with the San Antonio community. While the monarch is the metaphor, the garden reminds visitors that through respect, dialogue, and a true spirit of collaboration, all of our communities can be nurtured and thrive. The addition of the North American Friendship Garden will bring another wonderful amenity to Confluence Park, and we anticipate the grand opening of the garden to be scheduled in April of 2021 around Earth Day. For today's announcement and to provide, um, sorry, for today's announcement and to provide a vision of what uh, we anticipate the garden to look like in the coming months and years, San Antonio River Authority staff have created the planting plan and the rendering that you see here of what the garden would uh, look like in the future. Using the funds generously provided by the Canadian and Mexican consulates, the San Antonio River Authority will offer as a contribution to this international project our time and expertise to install the new pollinator garden and the River Authority is committed to the long term operations and maintenance of the garden at Confluence Park. Confluence Park is named for the nearby confluence of San Pedro Creek and the San Antonio River. But the name is also fitting for the location of the North American Friendship Garden, as this new garden will represent a confluence of Canada and Mexico and the United States. You can see from the map, Confluence Park is about three miles downstream from the San Antonio famous Riverwalk. And it is close to Mission Concepcion along the Mission Reach section of the San Antonio River. To help demonstrate the unique beauty of the Confluence Park, I have a short video that I'd like to share and I will narrate while it plays. Confluence Park is a collaboration between the San Antonio River Authority and our nonprofit organization, the San Antonio River Foundation. 
Confluence Park was created as a unique space for place-based learning. This park is as much of an architectural triumph as it is an environmental stewardship success. Visitors can learn how the park was built to work with the environment by utilizing unique design principles that catch, collect, and use the rainwater that falls on the property. Confluence Park is also the place where San Antonio River Authority educators inspire actions for healthy creeks and rivers through the interpretation of the park's dynamic features and nature-based programming. This park nurtures future stewards of our environment by arming them with information on biodiversity, watersheds, and interconnected ecosystems to impact the future health of our planet. It's a beautiful location on the San Antonio River, and I hope that many of you that come to San Antonio will have the chance to visit Confluence Park. The importance of the North American Friendship Garden goes beyond a symbolic gesture of trilateral goodwill. This pollinator garden will add to the existing ecosystem restoration benefits found nearby on the Mission Reach section of the San Antonio River Walk. The Mission Reach is one of the largest urban ecosystem restoration projects in the United States. Over 350 acres of riparian habitat have been restored along nine miles of the San Antonio River. The restoration is less than a decade old, but the habitat is already demonstrating that ecosystem restoration can work in an urban environment. During a three-year avian study, the River Authority counted over 65,000 birds using the restored habitat, including over 200 different species. This included both residential bird species that live here all year long and migratory bird species that travel between Canada and Mexico using San Antonio as a rest stop. Just like this yellow warbler that you see in the photograph, this was photoed this photo was actually taken on the mission reach. So this is a real bird photo here in San Antonio of this bird that travels between our uh, habitat here and Mexico and Canada. The North American Friendship Garden will become a part of the important central flyway supporting the iconic monarch butterfly as well as other pollinator and migratory species. So I would like to thank the Canadian and Mexican consulates for investing in the North American Friendship Garden, which further strengthens our symbolic ties, but also further connects our biodiversity and environmental ties via the migratory species that travel between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Finally, the San Antonio River Foundation is adding some enhancements to the garden as well. To explain what these additions are going to be, I would like to turn the presentation over to Freitas Seligson, the Executive Director of the San Antonio River Foundation. Mr. Seligson, you may be on mute. We cannot hear you. I thought I understood Zoom. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I apologize for being on mute. Um, yeah, this pollinator garden is indeed a beautiful addition to Confluence Park. Uh, through our outreach efforts, the San Antonio River Foundation strives to inspire a sense of stewardship of our river and the incredibly diverse habitat it supports. While stewardship might start at home, we know that preserving healthy biodiversity is an endeavor greater than one region, one state, or one country. The North American Friendship Garden will be a living reminder of the power of our collective efforts. Located on the south side of San Antonio in what was once a commercial storage yard, Confluence Park was opened in March of 2018 to bring examples of native ecology to the urban core. 
through the efforts of the River Foundation, those of our many nonprofit partners and the San Antonio River Authority, over 38,000 students and guests have participated in educational programs highlighting ecology, healthy riparian habitat, and why our choices and actions matter. Jane Goodall is quoted as saying, quote, only if we understand can we care. Only if we care will we help. This park is designed to give people the tools so they can better understand their role in biodiversity and the inspiration so that they will care and act as champions of our natural world. Besides all of the outreach efforts, at the end of the day, Confluence is still just a park. It is a space where visitors can come and find solace in nature. Just as the flowering plants attract the pollinators, the River Foundation is proud to raise private donations to add amenities, which will attract visitors to the garden. Inside the garden, we will install two additional art benches. One, the one in the middle is the present one that's in, on the site. Not just a place to sit and reflect, the benches themselves will serve to inspire a call, a call to action. Additionally, we will be constructing a bug hotel for visitors to understand the vital role bugs and insects play in a healthy ecosystem. And really, what kid doesn't like bugs? A seed lending library, patterned after the little free libraries you see in many neighborhoods across our countries, where visitors can take their own seeds to create their own pollinator garden in their backyard. And with hope, then they will share that with their friends and families in their neighborhood and expand the pollinator gardens and create sanctuaries for the migrating pollinators. And last, a series of Loteria cards designed by local artists to use with our educational outreach efforts okay. here in the garden. As I mentioned, this pollinator garden will be a beautiful addition to Confluence Park and dramatically help in our educational outreach. Speaking of pollinators, it is now my pleasure to introduce Monica Michael, who is the inspiration behind the Monarch and Pollinator Festival here in San Antonio. Thank you, Freitas, and what an exciting project. Like you can't, sounds like a great place to have a festival, I say. Um, and speaking of that, I am going to share a presentation that I have ready for you all um, about our festival and what we've done this year and how we got here. I think it's really worth pointing out that collaboration between our three countries is really something that's historically tied to the monarch butterfly migration. Back in 1937, Canadian zoologist Fred Urquhart and his wife Nora started a tagging program that we still continue in a different form today. And it was, the, it was this program that helped us figure out the, the mystery of the monarch butterfly migration. For decades, they collect data from volunteer research associates throughout uh, Canada, the United States and Mexico. They call them back then research associates, but we call them today citizen scientists. And they were throughout the three countries uh, contributing data over many decades. And then almost 40 years later in 1975, Catalina Aguado Trail and her husband, who was an American, Catalina was from actually Michoacan, they discovered the monarch butterfly roosting sites. And we always put discovered in quotation marks because obviously indigenous peoples were aware of the monarch roosting sites long before the Western world saw them on the cover of National Geographic there in August of 1976. Let's flash forward about 40 more years and San Antonio was named the first monarch butterfly champion city by the National Wildlife Federation. This was an initiative launched by the NWF in response to pollinator decline and colony collapse disorder um, and the decline of the monarch population. Uh, there were 24 action items that the NWF recommended a city do, could do and to participate, the city had to do three of those things. 
um, to be in the leadership circle, a city had to do eight of those things. And San Antonio unbelievably came across and was the first city to do all 24 things. It was, um, a lot of that was due to the fact that the San Antonio River Authority had already done 18 of the things. But these were things like uh, change mowing schedules and to organize a monarch butterfly festival. So that was how our festival came to be, it was exactly in response to this initiative. And it makes a huge amount of sense that San Antonio, which lies in the heart of the migratory flyway, you've seen the maps, um, you know, we've got Canada in the north, we've got Mexico to the south, and in the middle is what we call the Texas funnel. And all of the monarch butterflies east of the Rocky Mountains must funnel through this part of the world every fall on their way down as they're doing now and in the springtime when they wake up from their roost, mate, and then move north to lay their eggs on milkweed plants. This is antelope horns milkweed and it's the only plant in the plants in the Asclepius family. There's about hundred more than hundred species, but this one grows in Texas. And very often the first generation of monarch butterfly eggs are laid on these plants right here in the heart of Texas and South Texas. As they move, move north over the summer and multiple generations hand off the baton and keep going north and then in the fall around the equinox in September, they start heading south again. And the most important thing at that time in the migration is for these butterflies to fatten up. And that's why we like to encourage the planting of nectar plants in the fall. The butterflies can sip on that nectar and get nice and chubby so they can make it through the winter. And since 2016, when we had our first festival, we've had more than 25,000 people attend our events. Um, that usually consummated at the Pearl in person with one-on-one -on -one monarch butterfly tagging demos and all kinds of educational activities and events. We've tagged more than 3,000 butterflies at the festival over the last five years, and eight of those have been recovered in Mexico. Um, that tag that you see on there is a, um, is a product of Monarch Watch, which is a University of Kansas at Lawrence citizen science initiative where we tag the butterflies, report the data, the name, the date, the name of the person who tagged it, where it was tagged, is it a male or female? We send all that data into Monarch Watch and then in Mexico, people there uh, in Michoacan and the state of Mexico are paid $5 per recovered tag that they find on the forest floor. So it's also an element in some ecotourism and e economic possibilities for that part of the world. So we've had eight of ours recovered. We've also um, had more than 565 pollinator habitats pledged as a result of our pollinator habitat challenge, which was also an initiative pushed by the National Wildlife Federation as one of the 24 action items. So of course this year we were unable to do um, our usual hands-on events with VIP dinners and culinary uh, events and one-on-one -on -one tagging demos. But we did, just like the Monarch, we had to pivot and, uh, you know, in the face of obstacles, figure out a way to make it happen as we all have. And so we've had about, I believe, 18 events now online that we've made available to everyone and everything's been free. Um, the other thing that we did differently this year is because we couldn't tag the Monarchs one-on-one -on -one with people we offered to tag butterflies in, the, in memory of those who died. So people were invited to submit names of people who had passed away to a Google Doc and we record those names. And when we send in our tagging data to Monarch Watch, we'll, we'll be including those names of those who died. And hopefully as the Monarchs arrive in Mexico, sometime in the next week or so, they're already arriving as part of Day of the Dead. Maybe some of our butterflies will be recovered and we can report back to those loved ones that their butterfly made it. And we feel like that in today's world, given everything that we've gone through this year is a small gesture of hope and healing. And that brings us to our documentary. Um, because we couldn't gather in person this year, we decided that we would record and document all of our events. And so we put those together into a, a film that we're gonna show a trailer for right now. And I'm gonna stop my screen share and I believe someone else is going to uh, put the, um, the video trailer up there. So thank you for having us and thank you for this garden. I can't wait to go.
that having that kind of depth and connection is what makes the monarch so special and what makes this festival so special. It's more than just learning about this one insect. This insect is the doorway to all the other pollinators that are so important. What I have loved the most is being able to take this information and find really creative ways to engage the community for opportunities to learn and to have experiences. Year has won an incredible change, and that can be a really good thing. The question is, what kind of change? And I think that's the choice that people have to make this year. That video will be available on um, Thursday at 6.30 p.m online streaming everywhere. So if anybody would like to watch the whole thing, we'd love to have you join us. Thank you so much, Monica. Really uh, uh, appreciate you uh, for putting that video together and for what a great presentation from um, uh, Mayor Nuremberg, Consul General uh, Minuti and uh, uh, Consul General McCormick and our uh, guests. Um, I think in the comments section, they were talking about bug Airbnbs, which was uh, quite quite something. Uh, looking forward to seeing how that turns out. Uh, uh, and what a great tribute to those who have lost their lives due to COVID. So uh, thank you, Monica, for sharing um, that video, which will also be available uh, in, the, in the chat room to share. Um, the second part will feature city representatives from our friends in Montreal and Guadalajara, as well as right here in San Antonio, discussing policies to support biodiversity and access to nature. Uh, again, if you're tuning in and want to hear interpreters uh, in Spanish or French, please click that globe uh, icon and you will hear that. And I know uh, we've had some recommendations for hearing impaired. Thank you for those suggestions as well. Um, as we start our second part, I wanna introduce Julia Murphy. She's the City of San Antonio's Deputy Chief Sustainability Officer and is on the team implementing the city's first climate action and adaptation plan. Uh, Julia has helped establish the Mayor's Youth Engagement uh, Council on Climate Initiatives, uh, which is very cool. Some of her other projects include uh, the land conservation over the Ed Ed Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone, implementing my, my favorite thing, which is uh, uh, the first bike sharing system in Texas along the San Antonio River and establishing the Hardberger Park Conservancy. She serves on the board of Texas Land Trust uh, and is the product of UT Austin with both a bachelor's and master's and her full bio is in the chat room. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Julia. Thank you so much, Armin, and thank you for that nice introduction. Um, I really enjoyed watching our VIPs announce the special pollinator garden. And like Monica, I can't wait to visit either. It's going to be a wonderful spring to, to celebrate that uh, the establishment of the garden. Um, so at this time, I would like to welcome part the participants uh, that are listening in. Uh, you'll be hearing from city staff from San Antonio, Guadalajara, and Montreal talk about the importance of local policy to stitch together this global cooperation in the regeneration of biodiversity. I'm also going to invite the audience to check um, out the World Affairs Council page for this event. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see some supplemental um, documents that you can access, uh, one of which highlights um, some transformational projects that are going on in our three cities that support biodiversity and access to nature, which is also an important gateway to get our residents excited about preserving and protecting nature. We need to get them to care about it, as Freitas mentioned earlier. Um, this afternoon, we will begin this panel discussion by hearing about the origin story of San Antonio's participation in the National Wildlife Federation Mayor's Monarch Pledge. Patrick Fitzgerald, who leads the National Wildlife Federation's Community Wildlife Program, will describe how local governments across North America are committing to natural resource protection. From there, we'll learn how these actions are contributing to the global 
advocacy agenda in the lead up to the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, which will be occurring next year in Kunming, China. Next, you'll be hearing a little bit more from the three cities represented here. So in addition to myself, I would like to welcome Paulina Cervantes Flores, who will describe Guadalajara's designation as a tree city of the world and related green infrastructure projects. Paulina heads up the city's environmental department and has extensive experience in sustainability, climate change, and environmental policy and projects. We'll also be hearing from Dr. Maxime Larive, who joins us today from Montreal. He is the director of the Montreal Insectarium, Space for Life, as well as the co-founder of eButterfly, a citizen science platform for monitoring butterfly biogeography across Central and North America. His work advances the central concept of reconnecting citizens with nature through collective action. Welcome to my distinguished colleagues. And at this time, I'll pass the uh, screen over to Patrick Fitzgerald of the National Wildlife Federation. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Julia. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of this uh, panel. Um, our partnership with the city of San Antonio to help save the monarch butterfly and support pollinators began about five years ago. Uh, the city of San Antonio was one of the first major cities to take uh, the mayor's monarch pledge in the United States. And as Monica mentioned earlier, actually helped to create the monarch champion category. Um, and this means that San Antonio committed to all 24 of the uh, conservation actions uh, that include changing local ordinances and policies, uh, using native plants and increasing habitat and educating and engaging residents on, on how to help monarchs and pollinators. So um, the, the university, um, it, it was actually at the University of Texas at San Antonio um, where we had the location of a tri-national meeting hosted in March of 2017 uh, by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Commission for Environmental Cooperation that facilitated the adaptation of the program to be implemented in Mexico and Canada. So today, five years after the launch of the program, the city of San Antonio together with the Alamo Area Monarch Collaborative, our local monarch conservation network are continuing uh, to make a difference for the monarch and the residents of San Antonio. Uh, and today we have more than 600 pledges across North America including 84 in Canada, 42 in Mexico, and actually more than 100 cities in Texas, uh, supported by my colleague, Rebecca Canonias Pinon. Uh, seven additional cities now have followed San Antonio's lead to become champion cities. So it is fitting to be having this tri-national meeting on urban biodiversity here in San Antonio, and together with so many partners across our three nations. So our panel discussion will be moderated by Kale Roberts, the United States staff lead for ICLEI's Cities with Nature Network, an organization that I personally deeply admire. The network is an international platform for local governments to share best practices around supporting urban green space, native species, and access to nature. Kale is a senior program officer and the network coordinator for ICLEI, Local Governments for Sustainability USA, where he provides technical assistance to cities on greenhouse gas emission inventories, biodiversity, sustainable development, and climate planning. Take it away, Kale. Thank you so much, Patrick, for that very nice introduction. The feelings are definitely mutual, uh, mutual and I always admire the work that you do um, and that National Wildlife Federation does to make sure that our cities are better places to live in, um, that our schools are better places to learn in, and our backyards are better places for all types of life to flourish in. Um, I'm very honored to be here with all of you and moderate this panel featuring um, three leading cities doing the crucial work of ensuring that natural environments have a place in urban environments and that people have opportunities to access both. Um, as Patrick said, my name's Kale, 
and uh, I help lead the biodiversity work stream uh, with our ICLE member cities, towns, and regions. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the work that we do here at ICLE, uh, you'll know um, that we're a network of 2,000 local governments uh, committed to uh, uh, creating a development path that is climate neutral, equitable, and people-centered, resilient, circular, and of course nature-based. Uh, some of that work is pretty technical. On the ground in cities um, to map natural assets or make sure that biodiversity is um, a part of uh, climate planning. Then the other part of the work is uh, on this global advocacy um, that Julia mentioned. Uh, so making sure that the voice of city governments is heard loud and clear throughout the halls of the United Nations and on the global stage. And it's within this advocacy agenda that cities and biodiversity are having a big year this year and going into next. Um, you know, we entered 2020 uh, into a super year for nature. One, when the UN's convention on biological diversity expires, um, but opening up the opportunity for a new deal for nature. Uh, always before, national governments were the ones striking these types of deals. It is a UN convention after all, and so the targets were, um, were chosen, deliberated on by countries. Uh, but in this post-2020 biodiversity framework work, um, sub-national sub governments, uh, cities, for the first time largely, have a seat at the table and are seen as critical to making sure this new deal works. Um, in fact, uh, Mayor of Montreal, Mayor Valerie Plante, is uh, the ICLE Global Ambassador on Biodiversity and is inviting local governments all over the world to engage in this process. Uh, heading towards Kunming next year. Um, and how those cities uh, uh, online and elsewhere can engage is through the Cities with Nature platform. Uh, cities with Nature, all one word. Um, this is the official space for cities and regions to collaborate in the lead up to the Global Biodiversity Framework update, um, which will happen in China in 2021. Uh, we have 174 cities engaged so far, Montreal, of course, and San Antonio joining as pioneers to the platform uh, with Guadalajara, hopeful to join soon. Um, so it's within this context uh, uh, of a hopeful, you know, new deal for nature with cities at the center that I want to turn to our panelists um, who come from cities who are implementing the new deal uh, right on the ground today. And I'd like to start uh, the panel discussion uh, with the city of Guadalajara uh, and Paulina. Um, so Paulina, my, my question for you is, why is it important uh, for local governments to focus on biodiversity in cities at all? Oh, Paulina, I think you are on mute. <laughs> Great. I'm going to talk in Spanish, so be sure you have the interpretation. Buenos días a todos, buenas tardes. Soy Paulina Cervantes, directora de Medio Ambiente de Guadalajara. Para contextualizarlos a todos, Guadalajara es la segunda metrópoli más grande de México. Está ubicada en la parte centro-occidente de México. Y bueno, más común y más conocido porque eh, de ahí viene el mariachi y el tequila. Una vez puesta en contexto donde estamos, quisiera platicarles por qué, por qué es importante para las ciudades invertir y promover eh, la biodiversidad. En Guadalajara hemos entendido que para tener ecosistemas sanos debemos cuidar nuestra flora y nuestra fauna nativa, proveer hábitat a los polinizadores para mantener el equilibrio de nuestros servicios ecosistémicos. Y como símbolo de esto, hemos apostado por un proyecto que nos encanta y que es icónico, que se llama Arboretum, que se situó en el corazón de nuestra ciudad, en el centro, donde colocamos en un espacio donde antes había eh, cemento y poca vegetación, colocamos 83 árboles de la región y un jardín polinizador para recordarnos, como, para que sea un mensaje y un recordatorio de la importancia del cuidado y la prevención de nuestros ecosistemas para regresarle a nuestra ciudad 
eh, esta, esta, salub esta salubridad para que pueda ser una ciudad sana y sustentable. También, eh, a partir de esto y entendiendo la importancia y el rol principal que juegan estos polinizadores, creamos el programa Conectando con Alas. Este programa busca da dar hábitat, proveer hábitat a las especies polinizadoras, no solamente a las mariposas y a las abejas que, que nos gustan a todos, ¿no? también están dentro de este, de este paquete de polinizadores los, los murciélagos, que muchas veces tendemos a, eh, o a la ciudadanía no está acostumbrados a estos, pero tienen un rol fundamental en nuestros ecosistemas. ¿sí? Eh, buscamos regresarle a la ciudad las flores, porque por mucho tiempo buscamos vegetación que fuera muy fácil de mantener, que no requeriría mu mucho mantenimiento y nos olvidamos de colocar flores en la ciudad. Entonces, entendiendo que requieren estos animales polinizadores un espacio, es que volvimos a colocar flores en la ciudad, flores eh, y plantas que invitaran a estos a recuperar los espacios que habían perdido por la expansión urbana. Colocamos o entendimos, nos dimos cuenta más bien que la monarca se estaba quedando sin alimento, puesto que su alimento, que se llama, es una planta que se llama esclepia, es una planta que crece en espacios eh, en desuso, espacios y, y lugares baldí, eh, lotes baldíos, y estos han sido eliminados con la construcción de nuevos edificios. Entonces nos dimos a la tarea de crecer desde semilla la asclepia en nuestros viveros y regresarlos a la ciudad. Entonces estamos dotando de alimento a estos, a estos animales que son tan importantes para mantener el equilibrio en nuestras ciudades. Entendemos también que la conectividad es algo importantísimo para tener ecosistemas sanos y por eso creamos el programa de 50 corredores verdes que busca conectar las áreas naturales protegidas de nuestra ciudad con las áreas verdes y parques a través de distintos corredores y camellones. Esto lo hacemos eh, reforestando, plantando con árboles nativos, árboles de la región, pero también garantizando que los árboles que hoy tenemos estén en sus mejores condiciones. Y por eso hemos invertido en capacitar y en profesionalizar a nuestro personal para que estos eh, actúen y den manejo a los árboles con las mejores prácticas de arboricultura. Además, eh, implementamos o estamos es, estrenando o estamos inaugurando un nuevo programa que es la creación de hábitat con árboles secos. Eh, los árboles secos eran removidos de la ciudad porque significan un riesgo durante las tormentas, pero nos hemos dado a la tarea de identificar aquellos árboles secos que no representan un riesgo a la ciudad y que podemos eh, cuidar su estructura y cuidar su formación para que estos puedan ser espacios que puedan ocupar eh, animales como pájaros, murciélagos, eh, pericos, que a su vez estos nos ayudan a controlar las plagas. Estos programas, eh, sin duda, nos, nos ayudan a conservar y a aumentar la biodiversidad de nuestra ciudad, pero también eh, nos hacen ser una ciudad mucho más sana y resiliente. Gracias. Great. Thank you, Paulina. Uh, when I think of Guadalajara going forward, I will have to associate uh, the place with uh, tequila, mariachi, and biodiversity now. Um, and I'm pretty uh, uh, fascinated by this idea of a butterfly being an ambassador for other pollinators, um, uh, bats and, and so forth, and even an ambassador for the plants that are needed to keep these um, animals uh, alive that are native to the region. Um, so on this topic of, of fostering uh, an environment for native um, species, um, I'd like to turn to you, Julia, in um, San Antonio. And, and could you tell us a bit about um, something San Antonio is doing to enhance native species in your city? Yes, thank you. Um, well, earlier Patrick mentioned the Alamo Area Monarch Collaborative, and I, I do want to give a shout out to that a group of organizations and individuals who came together when we signed on to the Mayor's Monarch Pledge to really work together towards um, achieving those um, objectives and actually establishing a master plan to get there. So together between, there's uh, many organizations involved, um, including the River Authority, the San Antonio Zoo, Texas Parks and Wildlife, the city's uh, Parks and Recreation Department, um, the 
local museums are involved too. And uh, there are many, many, I, too many to mention, but um, they have banded together to both uh, restore habitat and also uh, the education and awareness piece has been a huge um, effort on behalf of all the organizations to get the word out that we all need to work together to protect our vulnerable species. But one specific example that I actually like to um, point out that happened in San Antonio a number of years ago is, um, again, an example of great partnerships with the conservation of Bracken Cave. Uh, the Bracken Cave Preserve, Preserve which is um, run by Bat Conservation International and also some surrounding um, land that was conserved um, that's under management of both BCI, Bracken uh, Bat Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy um, was uh, in large part uh, made possible by uh, local politicians um, realizing the value of this amazing habitat for a migratory species, which is the Mexican free-tailed bat. Um, it spends its summers in San Antonio in this large cave, giant cave. Over We, we estimate about 20 million bats live there during the summer, they overwinter in um, in Mexico. But while they're here, they do an amazing job of an ecosystem service, which is they eat tons and tons of insects every single night when they go out feeding, which um, saves an inordinate amount of money to our farmers and ranchers who are growing crops locally, our cotton and corn crops in particular. And that, in turn, benefits the local economy, the Texas economy. So were it not for these bats that, that come to us every summer and take up residence, um, we would be spending an inordinate amount of money on, you know, probably eliminating those um, non-beneficial insects that destroy the crops, but also doing a world of other damage in, in that. So um, that's an example of just um, everyone coming together and realizing that these these animals that don't have voices and um, can't speak to us about their needs are really important for us and for our livelihood. And um, we're just so grateful that, that that occurred and this land is set aside for them, hopefully to come to for many years in the future as well. Thank you, Julia. And thanks for speaking to um, the ecosystem services that uh, that bats provide on top of pollination. Um, you know, we're we're here to think about biodiversity in cities, and that often means uh, conservation, uh, which calls to mind uh, parks and access to nature. And we're very familiar with um, the mental and physical uh, health benefits um, that conservation provides, uh, but it's just so important to point out that ecosystems provide um, many other services. Um, so with that thought, um, I, I'd like to think a little bit about um, City of Montreal. I'm going to turn to you, Maxime, and um, and ask you to speak to uh, this, this idea of ecosystem services and how you're realizing those benefits uh, in your city. Well, yeah, the idea of, of ecosystems is a, ecosystem services is at the core of protecting biodiversity. And I think the, the city of Montreal and, and obviously uh, everyone around the table here has fully understood that. Uh, ecosystem services come from, uh, you know, uh, the pollinators, obviously, uh, that put the food, help us put the, all the vegetables and the fruits on our table. Uh, it also is essential uh, for biocontrol. Uh, especially when it comes to insects and, and the biocontrol agents of, uh, of various pests. Uh, and we can think also of even uh, uh, filtering our waters in natural and uh, aquatic ecosystems. For example, decomposition uh, is, uh, is one of them. Obviously, I speak of, of insects, especially because I, this is where my expertise relies. But also, uh, when we think about insects as well, even in, in urban ecosystems, uh, we can think about uh, the, the notion of their, they, they're, they're the pantry of our, of our ecosystems, right? This is where most of the, they act as, as the food for a lot of predators as well. And, uh, and you know, it, many of the actions that we, we uh, are, are implementing in the city of Montreal is to, to foster the presence of these, these pollinators to ensure also that we, we maximize actions in terms of biocontrol uh, and through, through that, uh, especially.
Great. Thank you, Maxime. Um, Excellent. So, you know, thinking about this idea of a, a new deal for nature um, coming about next year and the lead up to uh, the, um, the UN Biological Convention renewing in Kunming, China. Um, it's not, you know, only a, a big year for nature. Um, it's also a big year for climate change. And there are efforts um, largely led by city networks to, um, you know, really marry this moment for nature with the, the moment that we need to have for the, the climate crisis. In fact, many people are calling for a, a Paris Agreement uh, for nature. Um, but unlike with the original Paris Agreement, with lar which largely left out um, considerations for nature. This new new Paris uh, moment for nature needs to, you know, bring climate and biodiversity together, and to, you know, address those crises at once. Um, so my my next question for for all panelists in in each city, um, I'm interested about how your city is is addressing climate change, and uh, what the biodiversity component of that climate action means uh, for your city. Um, so open to, to starting uh, anywhere. I guess I'll start us off. Thank you, um, Juliet. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you for that question. So as Mayor Nirenberg mentioned, we passed our city's first climate and action and adaptation plan at the end of 2019. Then 2020 uh, came and, um, you know, Unfortunately, it may have put the brakes on our immediate implementation plans to this new policy that we had just passed. But actually, um, the, the pandemic and other world events that have occurred in these intervening months have brought to light new opportunities to really align climate action with um, resiliency. Um, and so in both our mitigation and adaptation strategies that are outlined in our climate plan, we prioritize the promotion of bio biodiversity and healthy ecosystems because we know that enhancing natural assets will conserve water, save energy, improve air quality, lower or reduce the urban heat island, which in San Antonio, Texas is incredibly important to do and also ensure our local food security. So every one of those things that I just mentioned, not only benefit our natural world, obviously, but benefit the people that interact with our natural world and live in our cities. So it's a win-win. Taking action on climate uh, has to be done. We're not moving fast enough, but if we can keep reiterating that it improves people's lives just as much as uh, the rest of everything else that lives with us on this planet, um, I think we're going to hopefully make a lot more progress by continuing that message going forward. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, Paulina, maybe we'll turn to you next and uh, City of Guadalajara. Muchas gracias. Sí, bueno, platicarles que nosotros estamos muy contentos porque estamos a punto de entregar nuestro plan de acción climático, que será nuestra guía eh, para establecer y poder llegar a las metas que todos y que muchas ciudades que están aquí se establecieron de llegar a ser una ciudad neutral en 2050 y reducir a la mitad nuestras emisiones en 2030. Nos fijamos como meta que antes de terminar el 2020 se entregaría esta, este plan de acción y eh, lo vamos a lograr. Entonces, eh, y este plan de acción tiene la particularidad de que no estamos actuando como ciudad individual, sino que nos unimos como metrópoli para poder hacer y poder sumar esfuerzos y tener un mucho mayor efe, efe, efecto. Eh, nosotros estamos apostando a la Agenda Verde para poder hacer frente al cambio climático como un agente de, de mitigación, pero también es un agente que nos vuelve mucho más resilientes. Entendemos que fortalecer la Agenda de verde, verde de nuestra ciudad, llenar de arbolado nuestra ciudad, nos permitirá también tener eh, una ciudad mucho más sana y eh, personas mucho más sanas, que es lo que necesitamos en este momento que estamos viviendo. Muchas gracias. Great. Thank you, Paulina. I, I appreciate that you have people at, at the core of the work that you're doing on your climate planning um, and uh, utilizing nature's benefits for, um, for health. Um, so Maxime, uh, any, 
anything exciting going on in the climate sphere for Montreal? Absolutely. Uh, here, uh, at, at Space for Life, in collaboration with the University of Montreal, uh, Space for Life being the, the, uh, the museum complex, the city owned, the unique city owned museum complex uh, here in, in the city of Montreal, we are uh, working on uh, a, uh, a collaboration that's called the Transitional Pathways, which aims at understand, define, and debate what path will society actually. Uh, have to go through to ensure uh, that uh, climate change and uh, improve our resilience through ecological transition. So our, our three main challenges that are uh, identified through the transition pathways that we're working in a, in a collaborative de development approach is to uh, identify essential sustainable feeding approaches uh, through what we mentioned, the protection of pollinators, sustainable agri uh, urban agriculture is where we're actually working on uh, action plans for both of these elements at the city of Montreal for, uh, at, uh, at the time. Uh, obviously sustainable territorial occupancy and management, which is the straightening of our urban forests, increasing our, our canopy index, which we target our objective is to increase it by 20 to 25%, uh, protecting up to 10% of our agglomerate uh, land territory. Uh, we are actually in the process of uh, implementing potentially the the, the city's largest uh, natural area park uh, in North America with our, our Great Western Park that we're, we are currently developing. Uh, also work and fight for uh, avoiding colonization of invasive plants and exotic species, uh, and also the restoration of current woodlands and, and following, especially we, we are a victim of the emerald ash borer up, up here in, in Canada that has dramatic effects on, uh, on our canopy index, especially so uh, planting trees and restoring is really important. And finally, uh, making sure that our, our uh, convergence to numerical transition is also parlayed into an ecological transition. And we use a lot of, we're pioneers in community science, as it was mentioned, uh, where we, uh, we do, we use community sciences and science approach to monitor biodiversity. Uh, through um, Nuna, the Nunavik Sentinels, which aims at monitoring the impacts of climate change in, in the Arc, up in the Arctic in Quebec, but also Mission Monarch and E-Butterfly, as, as we mentioned earlier. It's pretty bold climate action to be protecting uh, land resources and to set some sort of target around um, natural area conservation, uh, you know, tied to a climate action agenda. Um, so to fo follow up uh, with you on that, Maxime, um, th thinking about the importance of the natural world and the risks if we don't take this kind of bold um, action on biodiversity, um, can you speak a little bit to what those risks might be for your community? I think we're 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 actually living some of the risks that it can happen to our community, right? Uh, the impact of, of globalization, the loss of biodiversity, is also uh, echoed through the pandemic that we're living, right? That the uh, it, it really is all about resiliency. It, it is about uh, I think the current pandemic that we're living. The one thing that we noticed up here in Montreal was this this initial really reflex for people to go back and connect with nature when they were confined. Uh, th this importance of, of nature for their wellness, for their, for their well-being, uh, and also the, the, the importance of biodiversity really at the, at the core of our values. So we're, we're looking at uh, a dramatic increase in, uh, in, in biodiversity loss uh, that is uh, unparalleled in history in, in, its, in its, uh, uh, rate uh, over time and the impact on, uh, that it has on our local ecosystem services and our public health and, and especially uh, are even more uh, important in cities because of densities of humans that are there unparalleled elsewhere. So these, these are definitely the things that are uh, at the core of our preoccupations for sure. Sure and, and you, you know, speak to this rate of biodiversity loss um, that is really unprecedented and um, the, in modern history, at least. I, I'm recalling uh, World Wildlife Fund's um, a Living Planet Index report that they released uh, earlier this year, kind of gave us all a shock to see that uh, globally wildlife populations um, uh, drop 
by 68% in the last 50 years. Um, at the same time, we've seen that uh, in cities, um, uh, like those that you all work for, um, that pollinators can really be you, uh, you know, a used as an ambassador, um, ambassador to preserve land, to um, create uh, new ecosystems to support uh, the pollinator community, and then that extends to the rest of the um, ecosystem. Um, so specifically thinking about the monarch butterfly um, and the amazing work that's going on between the three continents and the three cities here on the line, um, a question for all of you is how can the, the migration of the monarch be a model for international cooperation um, in, in other spheres? I can start if you want. Sure. Um, I think the, the monarch is, 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 is not just an example, but it's also a model for the collaboration that is needed. Uh, it has no borders, right? It, uh, it also, uh, by nature, uh, has a, it, it's, it's touched everyone. Uh, everyone has a personal story, whether it's in Canada, in U.S., and in, Mex in Mexico, with the monarch, and it's uh, it, it uh, it's uh, precipitous decline over the last twenty years has really forced us to uh, to come together uh, in, in unity to to really identify from a, a trilateral, trinational perspective how can we. Uh, individually in our own countries, but collectively across the continent work together to ensure that every local action that is taken, whether it's at the local government level, whether it's at the provincial, state, or federal level and tri trinational level uh, is aligned so that we can ensure its conservation. And uh, I, I have to say that I, I've been very proud to be part of the, uh, the Trinational Monarch Conservation Partnership. Uh, and the, the tools that have been put forth uh, and the, the work that has been done with the, the Commission for Environmental Com uh, Cooperation in this regard to bring us together uh, and ensure that all the conservation actions that are, are made locally and uh, trinationally are aligned and through the tools that have we put together with the Monarch Conservation Toolbox, uh, now the annual uh, International Monarch uh, Monitoring Blitz that it helps us also uh, measure the, the size of the summer breeding uh, population, which has never been, had never been done before, it could only be done through an international cooperation, and finally access to uh, a trinational monarch knowledge network that every country uh, can use, every scientist uh, can use so that uh, it's, uh, you know, we can, we don't have to, we can assess the urgency and, and have access to the data so that we can, we can deal with this rapidly. And I think this model as it really speaks to, to how we can approach the overall biodiversity crisis collectively. Thanks, Maxime. Um, Paulina, yeah. if, you, if you don't mind, I would ask you the same question um, about how the um, support to the um, monarch butterfly migration could be a great model for international cooperation in general. Claro que sí. La mariposa monarca es la que es visiblemente eh, la que nos pone en el centro el entendimiento de que todo está conectado. ¿no? Podemos a través de ella entendernos como un, un solo ente eh, que, tiene, que está relacionado eh, una ciudad con otra. Eh, y este, este, este ejemplo de colaboración sin duda nos pone eh, el reto de buscar cómo conectamos con otros asuntos. ¿sí? Eh, Si logramos conectar a la mariposa monarca, seguramente estaremos conectando otras especies eh, de biodiversidad en nuestras ciudades. Es entender que todo lo que hagamos de, a nivel local repercute a nivel global. Entonces, si creemos que alguna acción, como nosotros que empezamos colocando pequeños jardines polinizadores, si creemos que no, que no tiene gran impacto, estamos equivocados. Estamos ayudando a que la mariposa monarca que viene desde Canadá pueda pueda llegar a su destino y pueda desarrollarse y pueda eh, crecer en proporción si cada una de las ciudades hacemos lo que nos toca. Entonces es una invitación a que no sintamos que las acciones son pequeñas. Si todos nos unimos en acciones locales, podremos hacer un cambio global. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, that is uh, inspiring. Inspiring message. Um, Julia, do you have any thoughts? 
Yeah, I, I thank you for mentioning the World Wildlife uh, Report. When I saw that headline a few weeks ago, I mean, it was really um, stopped me in my tracks because, you know, even though we work on this, this is our job um, to work on sustainability and climate action. Um, the fact that that statistic happened in my lifetime was really upsetting because I think as a little girl, I always thought that we would have wild animals and um, beautiful nature. And, you know, I, I want us to all think that we cannot take this for granted because it is disappearing rapidly. And we all collectively need to work together to reverse that trend. So, so the, uh, it's almost harder to put a dollar value on the beauty and um, aesthetics that um, nature adds to our, our world. Um, I hate that we have to always reduce things to dollars and cents, but what what is the value when you watch a bird formation, you know, that's flying through the central flyway in the sky or simply reflecting on the butterflies that are um, resting in the fields and um, the, the wildflowers that they feed on the the water that bubbles up from the streams and creeks in central Texas is it's clear and um, gorgeous to look at. I mean, that sense of wonder that you get from watching that. And just looking out across um, in watching a sunset at night. So that these things that are really hard to put a, a value on are why conservation is so important to our city to I'm sure the other cities that are on this call. So, and then we need to expand that to our states, to our countries, and then throughout the world. And so um, I hope that this conversation has inspired people to think about maybe a way that they can contribute to um, this collective work that we're doing to help those who don't have a voice uh, of, for themselves. They rely on us to speak for them but we rely on them so much. And so it's worth it for us to, um, to, to pledge to commit to conservation. I don't think that we could have a, a better closing remark. Um, I, I know that we still have uh, some more time together and I, I certainly can uh, keep, um, keep having this conversation move forward. It, uh, it's been excellent to hear on uh, what's going on in, in each of your cities, but um, do we do we wanna to move to some closing statements or I, I have an impromptu I can throw at you, Julia. Go ahead, since we still have time, Kayla. Okay, if we can. You, yeah, you mentioned <laughs> the, 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 the bubbling water and the other cities on the line that are inspired by um, kind of bold action. Um, where I'm at in, in New York, um, the city was faced with uh, a question several years back on how to protect the drinking water supply. Um, should they build a very expensive, you know, infrastructure system um, to, to process uh, uh, drinking water and, um, and storm water and other uh, uh, um, water infrastructure, or uh, should they look upstream about preserving the habitat um, and the ecosystem that um, that are the headwaters for New York City's drinking supply? Uh, they did go that latter route and ended up um, preserving a large part of the state at the same time having some of the cleanest water ever. I bring this up because um, San Antonio is known for a similar project, um, but this time preserving um, aquifer uh, uh, water for um, or through conservation based approaches. Um, and I, I love to hear about this project. So I, I wondered if you'd spend a a couple minutes um, walking us through how that, that works in San Antonio. I sure will. Um, so the majority of our drinking water supply in San Antonio comes from an underground aquifer, the Edwards Aquifer. And um, it's an amazing, amazing natural resource. It's very clean uh, water. It uh, falls on land and gets filtered through the land through karst for formations. Uh, that base limestone that basically purifies the water. So when it comes out, um, very little has to be done to it to make it a drinkable um, source that we, again, all depend on for 
to live. Um, so since 2000, the city of San Antonio has um, committed about $280 million to the protection of over 160,000 acres of open land uh, through this program. And the land is primarily on private property. So this is a really great conservation model whereby um, the local government in, to protect its drinking water um, has struck deals with private landowners out in the recharge zone of the aquifer to basically give up their development rights um, so that that land can remain open for the rainfall to fall onto it, to enter into the aquifer and recharge it. Um, it's been a great program and a, a fabulous model of, again, kind of a public-private partnership that um, is for the common good. Yeah, thank you for laying that out. Um, a, a, a fascinating example also because it's something many cities can do, especially faced with aging infrastructure like we are here in the United States um, and many parts of the world um, to look towards these nature-based solutions. Um, so in our last, our last minute, um, you know, short, uh, short round before we turn it over to closing statements, um, you all work uh, for city government um, or sub-national government um, on uh, on biodiversity, on climate. Uh, but a lot of us are people who live in cities and get to benefit from um, the work that you all do working for the government. Uh, so when your residents of cities ask you, what can I do at home to do my part for nature? Um, I'd like to hear what you each uh, would say to them. And uh, maybe Paulina, if, if you don't mind, we could start with you. Claro que sí. Como decía en mi intervención anterior, eh, ninguna acción es pequeña. Entonces, la invitación para todos los, los ciudadanos y todos los que nos, nos escuchan es recordar eh, el respeto que debemos de tener por estos pequeños eh, animalitos que parecerían tan insignificantes, pero son los que nos ayudan a mantener la salud de nuestras ciudades, que es donde vivimos, pero también del mundo entero. Entonces, eh, en primer lugar, los invitaría a conocer cómo se desarrolla este ser de pasar de ser un, una oruga, que muchas veces eh, conocemos la oruga de la monarca, pero hay otras mariposas que tienen una oruga eh, que, a, que a la vista pudiera ser un gusano feo, ¿no? Eh, y, y de inmediato desecharlo o quererlo aventar, y es entenderlos, protegerlos y saber que este ser es el encargado de mantener la salud de nuestro planeta. Y por lo tanto, si queremos la salud de nos, queremos tener salud nosotros ahora como personas, eh, necesitamos garantizar la salud de nuestros ecosistemas. Muchas gracias por la invitación y eh, una invitación a todos a que hagamos un esfuerzo por tratar de cambiar nuestro entorno inmediato. Wonderful. Paulina, uh, Maxime, in, in Montreal, what do you tell your neighbors that they can do to help? That's an excellent question. It actually comes up often. Uh, and the, uh, I, I focus on three things. Uh, I, the first one is to, uh, I encourage them to, to build uh, natural habitat, whether it's in their backyard, to contribute to, to, to local urban agriculture. Uh, we, we, uh, and then once they've done that, once they've built their native pollinators and stuff, uh, a little bit, they build it and they will come. Uh, if you know this reference, uh, you know, uh, indulge in, in observing the nature that will come and the, the native pollinators that will come to your garden and everything, and then document it, uh, share the information through our citizen science programs uh, so that we can monitor the, the native pollinators that are present and, and also assess how they're changing over time. And then finally, talk about it, uh, make a difference locally, uh, ensure that uh, you, you spread the word and encourage other people to, to build these native habitats around them and contribute to your local environment. And obviously, uh, ultimately, so that we can collectively have a, a global impact. Wonderful, appropriate to, to close in, in San Antonio. Uh, Julia, have any advice for your neighbors? <laughs> I, I'll have one, one last piece of advice and that's to compost. If you don't compost, learn how. It's an amazing way to advance the circular economy and give back to nature and, and, and our soil. 
Wonderful. Thank you again to our panelists um, and uh, ready to turn it over for closing remarks. Thank you so much, Kale. Thank you, Paulina, Julia, and Dr. Maxim. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry very quick for a uh, short, some closing remarks. Well, thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. And on behalf of the City of San Antonio, I wanted to thank all of our participants, as well as our attendees who joined us today on this important journey. Armin, I want to thank you. We so appreciate the work of the World Affairs Council of San Antonio and your efforts to make this event possible today. I uh, want to also thank uh, Samantha Scori with your team for her amazing talents and skill in producing all the beautiful materials that we've used for our promotion, as well as for our presentations. And thank you behind the scenes for coordinating the technical aspects. Uh, we want to show our appreciation to all of our partners at the San Antonio River Authority, the San Antonio River Foundation, the Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Festival. Uh, we're so pleased that we had the participation of the cities of Montreal and Guadalajara, as well as our friends at the National Wildlife Federation and ICLI. Also a big heartfelt thanks to our team at the City of San Antonio of the Office of Sustainability. Also uh, the uh, our World Heritage Office, which oversees our Creative Cities Network, uh, our Arts and Culture uh, Department. And of course, I, I do want to say a big thank you to our team team and economic development in the Global Engagement Office, Martha Henry, Ian Cruz, uh, for their work as well as we prepared for today. Thank you, Armin, turning it back to you. Uh, we appreciate all of you. Thank you, Sherry, and, and kudos to uh, Sherry Dolat Shahi and her team, uh, Martha, Ian. Uh, you know, Sherry has, uh, has so many wonderful skill sets. One is bringing all of us together. She does that quite a bit in our community and internationally. So thank you to Sherry for having so many of us here to, uh, to have this really wonderful program. You know, we're a week away from election day uh, with all the stuff going on around the country. What a great program and example of cooperation um, and collaboration between the three countries. Uh, thank you to our guests, to our moderators. Please stay updated about what we're doing with, at the World Affairs Council. Uh, you could go to our website, which will be in the chat room, and we'll follow up with everyone uh, as this is being recorded. Uh, thank you to our interpreters and to uh, our viewers on Facebook, our Instagram people, and uh, also our guests who are tuning in. Uh, you all have a wonderful day, and thank you so much.